All right. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sage Trudeau. Um, I am an assistant staff member at MIT Lincoln Laboratory. I work in the cyber physical systems group uh, where we study various kind of ins and outs of cyber physical systems. Uh, today I'm going to be presenting a little bit of work that myself and Hope Hong, another staff member, did last year uh, where we had some systems that were already out in the field that had some software defined radios already in them. Uh, and we attempted to implement a TDOA geolocation solution on them. Uh, and I wanted to share some of the lessons learned that we kind of did there uh, and walk through some of the exciting stuff. Okay. So a little bit of background. Uh, what we were trying to do here is basically locate unexpected emitters in a base encampment scenario. Um, I won't go too far into this, uh, but it helps frame the problem of why we we're interested in this to the get-go. Uh, and currently, it's kind of a long process where they, they wander around. And so what we wanted to do here is be able to automate this process a little bit. Obviously, geolocation, not a, a new kind of concept. Uh, but we did have some interesting constraints of wanting to be extremely wide band. Uh, we wanted to remain signal agnostic. We wanted to be near real time. Uh, so in our case, within a couple of seconds, uh, and we wanted a receive-only system because it was important to not be additionally polluting the, the EM spectrum in the areas of interest that we wanted to work with. So based on these constraints, uh, we decided that a geolocation solution uh, that we were going to pursue uh, was going to be a time difference arrival based technique. Uh, there are many other techniques out there, but this is the one that we decided to go with. <clears throat> So uh, for those of you that are not as familiar with TDOA, uh, I'll take a quick moment to kind of introduce it. Uh, hopefully you've, you've sort of heard of this before. Um, but basically it's a technique used to be able to calculate the location of a transmitter by using the difference in arrival time uh, between three or more receivers. Uh, and so by calculating the, the difference in arrival time, uh, you can then figure out kind of all possible locations that that signal could have come from. Uh, to explain that time difference, and then you are able to, uh, through the different pairs, kind of estimate an actual geolocation estimation. So our, our pipeline uh, and kind of the, the four major steps that are involved with this uh, is you need to get your receivers time synchronized. So that's the most important first step. Uh, you then have to get all of your data to a central node uh, to be able to calculate a time delay estimation. Uh, and then you calculate these hyperbolas from that time delay estimation, uh, and you then turn it into a, a map pin by the intersection of all of four of the hyperbolas, or three in this case. So uh, on that first step here, basically what we wanted to do is be able to use the Edis X310s that we already had available in the pod. Uh, and so thankfully through UHD, we're able to utilize time commands to be able to make this happen, uh, along with the GPSDO. They have some great documentation out there. I've also included it in my references if any of you are interested in doing this. Uh, you essentially calculate a new, new uh, clock baseline, you set a command time, and then you set that receive command to happen in n seconds, uh, and you end up being accurate, well, depending on what clocks you have in there, about plus or minus 50 nanoseconds. And for our case, that was gonna be a great place to start and you can utilize that to be able to have non-co-located receivers uh, all capture essentially the same you know, instantaneous moment in time. We then uh, perform the time delay estimation step utilizing cross-correlation. So there are a few different ways that you can do this. Uh, if you know more about the signal, you are welcome to utilize kind of a match filter uh, or maybe some kind of more advanced uh, pulse technique or something like that. Um, but if you want to remain, you know, extremely signal agnostic and work right over kind of a, a lot of different signals, uh, one common method is to utilize cross-correlation. Uh, and so we do a simple time domain cross-correlation on the raw IQ samples. And kind of the only downside of that is that you have to have all four data streams back at a central node before you're able to perform this step. Uh, and you can see this here that basically, uh, you know, it causes a nice little spike in the cross-correlation. Uh, when you, you kind of guarantee that you have the, the same signal at all four of your receivers, and then you can move along to calculating your hyperbolas. Uh, so for hyperbola calculation, uh, there are a, a few different ways to do this. Uh, we prefer to do the, uh, the actual derivation of the equation. Um, so we utilize the equation of a hyperbola uh, and then know 
basically the, through the speed of light and by setting up relative coordinate frames between our, all of our receivers, uh, we can figure out what that, that A squared and B squared should be. Uh, and then that lets us kind of have the general equation at our particular instantaneous time delay. Uh, so in a perfect case, uh, if the time delay is zero, then you, you don't have to worry about this, it's just kind of a straight line. Um, but as that time delay changes, uh, it describes the, the closeness that the, the transmitter was basically to one of your receivers rather than the other. Uh, and then you can calculate the hyperbola of all possible points that describe uh, where that transmitter could have come from. Uh, and between multiple sets of receivers, you then are able to kind of create this, uh, this plot on the right uh, where you get an intersection of these hyperbolas. Uh, and you use kind of, well, for the developers out there that are interested, uh, you know, this is how kind of the equation of the hyperbola actually applies in the essence of time. I'll, I'll skip over the math a little bit here. This geolocation result uh, then creates a, a polygon uh, in a perfect world. These would all intersect on the same point. Uh, unfortunately, that's not how this works at all. Um, and so you end up with uh, a varying degrees of intersection, some of good. Uh, we just use a simple approach uh, to then determine the centroid of that polygon and use that as our estimation. Uh, there's multiple kind of ways here that you can also do better guessing. So this is another area where there's opportunities for improvement. Uh, oh, and it is worth noting that uh, if that polygon's unbounded, uh, kind of a side effect of the way that TDOA is, is calculated uh, is that it does just kind of degrade to direction finding, which can actually be quite useful depending on what situation you're in. All right, so into the meat of it. Now that we've kind of described a little bit about TDOA just to get everybody up to speed. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about here today uh, is three major kind of phases that we set up along with the challenges that were associated with them. And my hope is that by sharing these challenges, uh, you guys, if you guys are, are uh, setting up something on your own, uh, we'll be able to avoid some of these pitfalls uh, and also be able to better understand how this technique is used actually in the field in real world situations. So the first phase was to be able to set up all of our, our equipment, shake out any of the bugs. We were really just concerned with getting our, our receivers timelined. The second phase, um, we wanted to understand better the importance of geometry, um, and we wanted to utilize a couple of techniques using a known transmitter in the area to be able to improve our time alignment from the first phase. And then in the third phase, uh, we were worried about trying to actually you know, send this out as something that could be a useful capability. Uh, and so there are data backhaul concerns associated with that. And there's a large amount of trade space that you have to play in there uh, to be able to have this actually be a near real-time system and be operational. So the phase one setup uh, is a roughly 15 mile square area uh, located around Boston. Fortunately, we had some team members that were very happy to generously donate their backyards. Uh, and so we set up kind of these, these ruggedized Pelican cases that are essentially just a server blade and some X310s uh, in people's backyards strapped to antenna masts. Uh, and we started uh, doing this technique. Uh, and basically, we just wanted to shake out our time alignment problems and so we were looking to be in a very wide area uh, and to look at very high power transmitters. So we started by looking at HDTV and FM stations that were in the area. And what we quickly found was that there's actually a pretty striking difference in, in accuracy between the two, um, even though they're, they're similarly high power transmitters uh, and we expected kind of great SNR on, in both cases. Uh, and what we, ended up looking into is that that accuracy is largely due to the difference in bandwidth between the two uh, transmissions. And so to highlight that a little bit better, uh, we dug into that, that bandwidth estimation problem. Uh, and what happens is that as that, band, uh, as that signal is na more narrow band, uh, if you're using simple cross-correlation, that cross-correlation peak flattens. Um, and as it flattens out, the odds basically that uh, Kind of noise or any kind of problem with your receive chain, uh, they cause that spike to be not as perfect. Um, and then essentially if you have the wrong spike, that ends up to a, an improper sample, which is an improper time estimate, which down the line becomes uh, an error in your location accuracy. Uh, and you can see here, uh, these are kind of three major examples. Uh, the, the third, the LTE station, is from a different phase of experimentation, um, but it helps illustrate this point nicely. 
And here are some, some actual results. So uh, as you're interpreting, interpreting these, uh, the red X is the known transmitter actual location, uh, and the black star is the, the estimate of our geolocation estimate of that transmitter. Uh, and these are, are two just kind of random examples uh, from our phase one testing, and they help illustrate how much worse this actually is, right? So in the case of the HDTV station, which has about a six or eight megahertz uh, wide, I forget off the top of my head, um, we get a pretty good estimate, right? Where we have a 15 mile square radius here, uh, and we're, we're able to find it within about 71 meters of the actual tower. Um, with our, our coordinate errors and everything else, uh, that's, that's reasonably solid. Uh, and then in the case of the, the FM station, it's not always this bad, um, but in this particular capture, uh, we're, we're quite far off. Um, and it's purely just kind of due to the, the two signals uh, being very different bandwidths. Uh, and that, so that's a common problem that you'll run into. Um, we figured that we were continuously running into this, uh, that it was probably worth it to, to model it out and make sure that we had experimental results and see if those were actually matching what we were hypothesizing what was the source of this error. Um, and so here are kind of some major data points over the course of all of our experimentation. Uh, and you, as you can see, the, the actual results, the green, they match the trend quite nicely, um, with the, the plus up being because the, the real world is not nearly ideal. Uh, and so you end up with uh, all of your various timing errors, which just add to your, your location degradation. Cool. Uh, so moving along here to the second phase. Um, in the second phase, we wanted to be able to detect lower power transmitters. Uh, and so what we're prom prominently looking for is LTE stations in this phase, uh, or the potential for some handheld uh, devices. And what we were saw initially is we set this up around Hanscom Air Force Base, um, which is you know a standard kind of small Air Force Base establishment. Um, and what we noticed was that although our cross correlations were looking really, really good, um, we were getting those great peaks as seen in the previous charts, um, we were still ending up with some bad location estimates, especially to the north. Uh, and we found this to be curious. And what we ultimately discovered is that uh, what we initially thought was not going to be that big of a problem. We had read that geometry mattered a lot for, for TDOA techniques, um, but it ended up being qu quite a big of an issue here. Um, and so we decided that we would take this opportunity uh, to investigate the importance of receiver geometry uh, and model that a little bit better. So this is a little bit of a lot going on in a plot. Um, but what you're seeing here is a, a GIF of us modeling that scenario. And so the red dot that is moving um, is that, that third receiver. Um, we're modeling moving it from an ideal location to the kind of junky location that it actually was in. Uh, and as we do that, we calculate uh, a, a TDOA estimate for each of those pixel locations. Uh, and so then we, we then map the color map uh, basically yellow are, are very poor estimates, um, and blue are very good. Uh, and this is without any RF involved, right? So we're, we're just doing it based on the, the speed of light uh, timing in between those points to use as the time delay estimation. Uh, and it shows how much the receiver geometry really matters, right? So you end up with, before you were even worried about the RF signal, if you've poorly set up your geometry of your receivers, you end up with these large areas of yellow uh, where you're not going to have good results no matter how well time synchronized your, your receivers might be. Um, so for what it's worth, the general rule here, uh, the best case is a regular polygon of whatever number of receivers you have. So whether that's uh, an equilateral triangle or a square or whatever you get to, and the worst case is a line. So just kind of avoid hiding them in each other's shadow um, and try and encompass as much area as possible. You'll end up with great results on the inside of your perimeter uh, and then slowly kind of degrading results as you leave that perimeter all the way down to where it then degrades to just a, a, a direction finding estimate. Uh, in addition to uh, kind of the, the geometry problem in phase two, we had also read that uh, there were some great ideas for additionally time synchronizing your receiver in the case that you had a known transmitter in the area. Uh, and so this is often the case. There are, there are kind of great high power transmitters out there, whether you're using one of those HDTV stations or anything of interest, an LTE tower or whatnot. Um, 
you can utilize that to better synchronize your receivers before you actually go to do uh, your, your stairs that matter that are going to be looking for unknown transmitters. Uh, and this is an old idea that's kind of prominently been used in, in the past uh, for uh, fixing bad cheap clocks uh, in various military systems and stuff like that. Uh, and I did want to give a quick shout out to Stefan Scholl. Uh, he has a very clean explanation of this in his 2017 SDR Academy presentation. Uh, and it was very helpful for me in implementing this technique. And the way this works is essentially because of the way that uh, software-defined radios work, specifically the Edis X310s, uh, as well as a lot of others, uh, you can switch the center frequency, frequency that you're interested in without dropping any samples. And so it lets you do calibration steps on uh, the first part of this kind of three-part capture that are then valid for the middle section. So the way you do this is you, you first stare at, say, you know, 750 megahertz where your known LTE station is. Um, you then calculate your geolocation estimate, and then knowing the true location of that transmitter, you can then correct for whatever your errors were. Uh, and then when you look at the, the middle part, which is staring at, say, an, an 850 station of an unknown signal, um, that same correction still holds true. Uh, and so you're able to gain some, some optimization here, um, and it actually helps out greatly. So I, I highly recommend this technique uh, if you're trying to do any sort of time synchronization between multiple non-co-located receivers in general. Uh, and so here are some results. What you can see here uh, is that this is quite useful. Um, we were initially about 213 meters away from the transmitter uh, with our first guess. And then with the correction, we're able to fix our time sync by about 550 nanoseconds, uh, which gets us down to about a 50 meter away uh, location error. Uh, in this case, we actually know where the, you know, the true location is of the transmitter, but we're treating the, the red one as unknown uh, to be able to determine how well this technique works. Right, that arrow ended up in a weird spot. So uh, moving on to uh, the phase three. Uh, our third phase is, is very similar setup to phase two, um, but we've adjusted the receiver geometry according to our lessons learned here. Uh, and our primary goal was to be able to try and improve the data backhaul associated with this problem. Uh, and we wanted to do that in order to be able to meet our, our real-time requirement. So what kind of to, to frame this better. Um, what I'm describing here is that the, the initial part in the top left is that the, the time synchronized capture happens at the edge. And then we have to send that capture back to the central node where we can then perform the cross correlation to then do all the rest of the pipeline. Um, what we found through just kind of some experimental results uh, on our cross correlation size uh, we found that about two mega samples uh, seemed to work well for us for kind of a bunch of different signals. And the issue was that over our kind of LTE backhaul link, uh, we're experiencing two to three minutes of delay for each of those captures. And so that's, that's far too slow and that's, that's never going to be useful for, for our use case. Um, and so we wanted to try and improve that. And one thing that we kind of had as an advantage uh, is that we already had some machine learning classifiers that were out at the edge. Uh, and so I will admit this is a bit of an over-engineered solution to this problem. Um, you can do a lot of, a lot of gains here with, with just filtering and doing signal detection in general. Um, but since I already had the, the classifier at the edge, I figured I would play around with it. Um, and some of the results are fun, and so I brought them here today to share with you all. Uh, so, what I'm proposing here uh, is essentially inserting the, the green, um, which is additional filtering. Um, and so I'm going to do this in two parts. Um, the, the first part was the, the classifier. We, were, we have a few there, but uh, in, for this presentation, now we're utilizing OmniSig. Um, it outputs a nice data product that tells you, you know, exactly where a particular signal of interest is in time and frequency. Uh, and so we can use that as a pre-filter to just slice out that signal and send only that bit back instead of worrying about sending back the, you know, the whole chunk or the whole file. And this actually results in you know, kind of some, some nice gains. Uh, so that was our first thought, is just to, to simplify this whole pipeline. Uh, we utilize OmniSig here. We slice this out, uh, and then we can send it back, and we perform then the, the same cross-correlation step, uh, just with a lot less data. Um, 
And this technique actually, it works great. Um, it depends kind of how well your, how dense your, your signal environment is. Um, but you can get a lot of a lot of backhaul kind of improvements by by just pre-filtering your data, which should not be a big surprise to many of you all. <clears throat> uh, we also we verify that that this still works, right? So we want to make sure that kind of pre and not filtered data provide the same result. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, we're able to kind of use this in phase three to be able to pick out what OmniSig thought was an LTE uplink. Um, I won't, I'm not sure whether that's correct or not, um, but it was very likely, uh, you know, some kind of transmission coming from one of our cell phones that happened to be in this area. So, <clears throat> all right, um, basically pre-filtering pre data is, is not, that's not anything new, right? <laughs> um, that's, uh, and so we wanted to push that uh, a little bit further uh, and see if we could kind of change the model of our pipeline by knowing that we had access to this classifier at the edge. And so what I'm proposing here uh, is taking that time delay estimation step and migrating that out to the edge compute. Uh, that slide really died on the, uh, <laughs> on the arrows there. Uh, anyway, um, I'm not sure why that didn't make it through, but basically uh, we slice out that that signal of interest, uh, and then we use a preamble lookup to be able to do our time delay estimation in a another fashion. Um, and really, that what I'm offering then is because of the machine learning classifier that's out there, um, I can create this idea of a lookup table, say for Wi-Fi or something like that, um, where I have known signals of interest. Um, and so I can use the preamble of Wi-Fi um, to be able to look up the sync sequence against it. Um, and determine my time delay estimation off of that, and then I never even have to send any of that data back to my central node. I can just send the time delay estimation, and the central node just has to calculate the hyperbola uh, and pop a pin on the map. And so to test this, uh, we, we did this in lab. Um, and so we utilized Wi-Fi for, for our purposes because 802.11, not one, uh, is a, a very well-known spec. Uh, it was easy to build a match filter against this, and so we, we use short and long training sequences to then match up, and we can get subsample estimation, which is then our time delay estimation, and this works really quite well. Uh, and so I want to kind of expand this work in the future uh, and try and be able to build out a, a larger signal lookup table. So in the case then where you have a known signal of interest, you can use this to your advantage uh, and get an even better result in you know a fraction of the time, and in, then in the general case, you can still operate. Uh, so uh, in summary, TDOA uh, is uh, very possible to be implemented on these Edis hardware. Uh, there are some kind of common pitfalls, but hopefully I've outlined a few of them in this presentation, uh, and you guys can avoid them in the future. Uh, and there's some exciting possibilities here with as these machine learning classifiers become a little bit more prolific uh, and are available at the edge compute, uh, there's some heavy optimizations that can be done uh, by utilizing them. So the, the next steps that I have envisioned, thank you, uh, uh, as I'm wrapping up here, is basically to expand that idea with the, the classifier uh, to do some, some quality of life improvements on some automation of the filtering. Um, and to do some optimization of better picking my reference receiver, depending on SNR and geometry from the lessons that I've learned throughout this. Um, all right, and so finally, uh, I really, in conclusion, uh, I'd, I'd like to thank all of you for, uh, for your outstanding work in the open source community. Uh, I do work for a defense contractor, and so I am fiercely aware that there are many times where, you know, kind of this, this interaction can feel like a one-directional street uh, where information comes to us and it, it never really leaves. Uh, and I am, I am strongly trying to fix this. Uh, and so at Lincoln, I am working really hard to try and be able to help open source a lot of our, our own projects that we've been working on. Um, and I have that working through the, the pipeline right now. That is a long process, unfortunately, um, but I have discovered a fun little workaround, and so I wanted to include it in this presentation. Uh, essentially, they, 
you know, I'm not allowed to share the code, um, but as many of you know, that you know, a lot of this is, is purely just researching, and so I, I went and found this code from open source areas already. Uh, and so there, there are no real rules about me sending up a, a, a very well-defined appendix. Uh, and so I've, I've included a, a whole bunch of slides here where if you're a developer, uh, these kind of go through and have screenshots of all of my resources uh, and include some information, some helpful tips for you uh, to be able to set this up on your own. And so hopefully this will kind of help tide over before I'm able to, to release the code. <clears throat> uh, so, so thank you all very much for listening. Uh, thank you, GNU Radio, for, for hosting this conference, uh, and thank you to Hope Hong, who it was a very it was a pleasure to work with her on this work. All right, I think we have time for like one or two questions. Okay. Thanks for the presentation. Uh, also, thanks for using USAP. So it was pretty, pretty cool. One thing I was surprised by, so you um, talked about sort of the correlation and classification for improvement, but I, I don't know, maybe I missed it. I don't think you mentioned like errors from multipath propagation in sort of TDOA. Um, like, have you looked at that? And also, um, there's like, um, you know, some algorithms like uh, Kalman filters and scented and unscented Kalman filters for like tracking, um, you know, movement of like the, you know, the identified targets. Have you looked into any of that? Does that... Yeah, um, we have uh, looked into some of that. A lot of that is additional work that, so I guess the, the underlying portion that isn't really shown in this presentation is this is one TDOA estimation. Uh, for a single data point, you know, moment in time. And you can keep doing this over and over on, you know, whatever that transmitter is that you're trying to track. And that's where something like a Kalman filter can come in uh, and have very good results uh, because, you know, you get the average of, of a whole bunch of results. Uh, and then in reference to multipath, um, we admittedly have kind of ignored that a little bit uh, in this research, mostly because we just wanted to try and set that up. Uh, there are you know, a whole bunch of resources out there on being able to, to find multipath, um, especially with the cross-correlation technique. Uh, you do end up with multiple spikes in different areas, uh, which often is due to a multipath. Um, and sometimes you can throw out or, or figure out clever ways for, uh, you know, determining uh, which one is the valid solution. Any other questions? All right. Yeah, any other questions? I don't see any hand. Oh. Uh, have you looked into incorporating frequency difference of arrival into your TDOA, TDOA estimates? Uh, yeah, for so uh, I actually think I, I might have cut that out, but um, I haven't. Um, we did look into, we, we we're in the process of looking into other kind of I would, I would bundle that into the time delay estimation techniques, right? Uh, and that is one of them that is, it is on the list. Um, phase difference arrival, frequency difference arrival, as well as kind of like Hilbert transforms um, and a few other things. All right, thank you. Uh, so let's uh, move on to the next speaker and uh, give Sage another round of applause.